Oh. All right, welcome to Culture Proof Live. This is, it's Tuesday and it's 8.15 Central. Mm -hmm. And that means that everyone who is hanging out with us, you've, you've joined us. If not, <laughs> finish up the mac and cheese yes. and get in here because it's time, <laughs> it's time oh, for us man. to start. So one of the things that we do before we get started, um, just to get everybody in and get everybody ready to go, um, is we just talk about what we had for dinner just real quick. OK, ah. so so just if you're if you're on the live and <laughs> you, you have already had dinner, hopefully that's many of us, um, then let us know what you had. Now, Paul Hastings is our guest and everybody knows that that's why they're here this week. So like if you weren't here last right. week, we see <laughs> you. Man. We see you logging in because Compelled is here. We see it. OK, <laughs> we know what's going on. Um, but Paul, we're going to start with you. So what is it that you guys had for dinner? Paul's tonight? Like, I'm fasting. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you're just so holy. No, uh, we had uh, sloppy joes, sloppy joes. Oh, oh, yum. Okay, take me back, man. That's <laughs> yes. that's fun. That's fun. Now, okay, one other question because I'm I'm trying to get a picture here. So, your kids, what are the age ranges of your kids? Their ages six, four, two, and six months. Yep. And so they wow. probably hear all four of them in the background yes. <laughs> we're doing this tonight. Same. Right on. We love it. Okay. We love it. So that's so I just I'm trying to get a mental picture because that means that you guys really had sloppy Joe's. Like, <laughs> oh yeah. This is right. Yeah. Truly sloppy Joe's. Wow. Yeah, you were spot on. Yeah, when you got wow. that age range. Okay, so that's good. So I'm looking here to see. Okay, Jennifer Miller, they had tacos tonight. Okay. okay. Split pea soup. Merle, that's really nice. Split Leftover chicken. Soup. Okay. enchiladas very nice mm -hmm. um we actually had um beef sliders now yes. when we do our sliders typically we do them bunless and then we have some sort of starch or vegetable next to them yeah and so tonight it was uh green beans but before people like congratulate us there was lots of bacon in the, <laughs> in the, green, in the beans. green beans but it was oh, good yeah. green beans can't stand alone it was good though Ooh, somebody I, snobby I had curry shrimp and rice Somebody really oh snobby. <laughs> Is that fried that rice, grilled Hamilton. chicken, and beans? M. Hamilton nice. III. Okay, very beans? nice. Fried rice, grilled chicken, beans. Very right. nice. I'm I'm loving it. We're getting all the responses in. So that lets us know that this stream is live and active and everybody <laughs> can hear us and they can hear you, Paul. So before we get like kind of right in the middle of what we wanted to do, because mm -hmm. we want to talk about um, college. We want to talk about the next steps for kids, right? Like that was actually a request of our uh, podcast listeners. They said, hey, we want to talk about college. How do you pick one? Um, does every kid need to go to college? Is there a way for uh, kids to get out of college without a lot of debt? And even in just thinking about that, Paul, we thought of you. So uh -oh. we want to get into a lot of that tonight. But before we do, why don't you just kind of introduce yourself to some of our listeners? So many people will be familiar with you, but for those who aren't, give us a little background. Sure. Okay. So here's my story. Uh, as you can see, I'm half Asian. My mom immigrated to America when she was 17 years old, didn't speak any English at all. When she got here, she promptly dropped out of high school and she dropped out of high school in Thailand. So she's a high school dropout. And then uh, my dad was a hillbilly from Arkansas. And he also dropped out at the 10th grade. And so both of my parents only got 10th grade educations before they dropped out, eventually got their uh -huh. GEDs. And so these two high school dropouts married each other and decided they wanted to homeschool their kids. And on, <laughs> on paper, of course, that just looks like that's a, a recipe for disaster, uh, which, you know, uh, we were our own disaster in our own right. You know, as every family's <laughs> there, a little uh, disaster squad there. But educationally, we actually turned out pretty bright. I've got an older brother, a younger sister. Uh, my older brother and I and my sister, we were all homeschooled K through 12. My brother ended up uh, going to Rice University and double majoring mm. in physics and math and eventually got his wow. PhD in sociology. Uh, and today he is a professor of sociology at Colorado State University. Wow. Um, and then uh, my younger sister, and maybe I'm maybe I'm diving too much into the weeds. No, I love it. Experience. You're actually laying a great foundation for where we ultimately are going to go, and and I think that's probably why you're sharing that information. Like that's, okay. I mean, that's really helpful for us to know. So keep going, keep going. Okay, I'll keep I'll keep rolling here. And so my younger sister, she's four years younger than me. Uh, she, you know, homeschooled the whole way through, and she was super smart. Also, she ended up uh, getting her associate's degree just a few weeks after she graduated from homeschooling. 
because she had been doing a lot of dual credit classes. Uh, mm. And then she eventually got her bachelor's degree in computer science. Um, and then I, on the other hand, uh, I managed to cram a four-year degree program into eight years. <laughs> wow. Paul. I, I, Paul. Talent, guys. I know. Are Paul, I'm, start, I'm starting to question this invitation. I, I didn't know that part. I mean, I've heard you speak right. in a number of different places. I, I don't think I've ever heard you mention that. I, I've only heard the great stuff. Like, I didn't. <laughs> okay. That's right. So, so also, and, and we'll kind of go through this a little bit as we go, but man, we want to say huge congratulations to you as the host of the Compelled Podcast. You guys hit 1 million downloads. Yes. Um, tell our listeners a little bit about Compelled. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's funny, even though I'm here ta tonight talking to you guys about college education, uh, what I do day to day has nothing to do with college at all. Um, <laughs> so what I, what I normally do is I'm the host of the Compelled Podcast. And we find people, Christians, with unique stories how Christ has transformed their life. Mm. And in fact, I just so happen to have a new push card right here, the Compelled Podcast. Look at that, guys. Oh, Look man. at that. Beautiful. It's Sweet. just some of, our, you know, some of our guests right there on the photo there. There's our logo. And so we, we just find people with really cool stories about what God is doing around the world and around the globe. And then we add sound effects and music and narration, and we bring and craft these stories together in a way that we think really draws a listener into the experience of fully engaging with what this person's uh, testimony truly is. And we always hmm. highlight God is the hero. Jesus is Amen. the hero of the story, Amen. not the guest, not us as the host. We're just hmm. simply instruments and little pencils, the real author, the creator, that's the Lord above. And hmm. so that's what we do on our show. Yeah, awesome. you do an incredible job. And yes. in fact, I mean, when we first started listening to Compelled, that was something that really struck us, that God, <clears throat> excuse me, that God is glorified, mm -hmm. that he is exalted. And, and even though you have these dramatic stories, the story or the person is not necessarily what captivates you. What captivates you is that you can see the hand of God, like in every piece as it builds along. It's, yeah. a, it's an amazing job that you do. Well, I appreciate that, guys. And I've got a great team. I can't take all the credit for myself. Uh, my wife's our associate producer, so she listens to everything ahead of time, kind of doing a, a content check on everything. And then I've got a couple great editors, and they are really gifted and talented at what they do. So I just feel really fortunate that God allowed me to develop those friendships and relationships with people to kind of bring it all together. Amen. And one thing I love about it is the great storytelling. I think you do a great job. You guys do a great job at that. Um, and when you listen, it's it's testimonies. It's raw testimonies, but it's done in such a way uh, it really keeps your attention. And man, it's, it pulls you in mm. and you see the goodness of God. That's what you leave uh, the, the, the the podcast, the episode, knowing that man, God is so good and that he's able to mm. take you out of all situations and circumstances if you, if you look towards him. So just really, really encourage so y'all need to check that out compare yeah share it share it That's download right. some episodes I, and share it can i just tell one short story before we dive into all the college stuff absolutely yeah. okay one short story we just re re released this one this morning actually so that's why it's like top of my mind so this is the most recent episode we've got this great story a young firefighter his name was cheyenne caldwell he grew up in los angeles and he was a firefighter he'd been a firefighter for about seven years and one day he responds to a house call uh, actually, it was a business that was on fire, and he just shows up. And, of course, he had made a profession of faith, you know, 10 years beforehand, but he had struggled with the temptations of the world. He was struggling with, like, how do you be a real Christian? But then, like, oh, there's all this worldly stuff going on. And so he was really struggling, and he responds to this house call. And it, it's a business call, not a house. He responds to the business call that it's, you know, the house is just – the business. I keep on saying house. The business is completely in flames. <laughs> And his job was to go up to the top onto the roof and take a chainsaw and cut a hole in the roof so that the smoke could vent out. And then the rest of the team could put out the fire, just kind of standard protocol. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he's been doing this for almost a decade now. And so he steps out onto the roof of this building and he falls right through it. The, the roof caves in where he's at and he wow. falls down into the center mm -hmm. of this, this massive inferno. <clears throat> he's not wearing his breathing protection. He's mm. holding a running chainsaw in his hands. He's wearing 80 pounds of gear on his back. And the the the, the fire is 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. That's wow. what he falls down into. Wow. And he tells his story 
of how God used this this moment in the fire to be the not just the defining moment, but the refining moment of his life, oh. where he comes to grips with like, is God real or is he not? Is he really my savior or is he just is, is he just my savior or is he my Lord? And mm. that is the moment for him where it all clicked for him. So anyway, oh, that's my goodness. Our newest testimony came out this morning. You should listen to okay. it. Okay. Compelledpodcast.com. Awesome. Just a quick little shout out. <laughs> all right. Shall we go ahead and transition? Sure. Sure. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to be leaning on. Let me just, I'm, I can't cover it, guys. I'm just going to have to tell you. Okay. So if you were here last week, I had like this stuffy nose and, and everybody's like, oh, you know, what's going on? You don't sound like yourself. So we didn't know what it was. It came out of nowhere. So here we are a week later and <laughs> it's returned. And so we have figured out what's causing it. Every Monday night, our son has a football game out at the ballpark. And we are there late in the evening. And so there is something there that triggers an, al an allergic reaction. So my allergies yeah. go crazy. On Tuesday morning, I wake up and I sound like this. So um, <laughs> <clears throat> I keep looking at Will the Great because I'm trying to cover it and I'm looking for him to jump in and rescue me. And there's no cute way to do that. I just have to say, <laughs> talk for a second so I can sniff. Talk for a second so I can cough. So I'm sorry about that. We'll edit it out in post. <laughs> okay. You know something about editing. Okay. Right. <laughs> Paul, you'll help us out. You'll jump I sure in. do. I sure do. It's all good, guys. It's all, we're all family here. Everyone, we're all family. It's just a hangout. Yes. It's just a hangout. Okay. So here's my, here's first question, Paul. And, and I think this is a big one. And I kind of feel like I need to back up just a little bit before I get to this question. So let me rewind. So you've got, <clears throat> you've got your parents who decide that they're going to homeschool. Take us back to that via what you learned as a kid growing up. What was their conviction? Why did they homeschool you guys? Oh, that's such a great question. I'm so glad you asked that one. So homeschooling back then, it was uh, it was pretty uh, not well known. It wasn't really uh, researched. Uh, my dad first heard about homeschooling back around like 1983. And there was a famous broadcast on the radio with Dr. James Dobson and another guy mm -hmm. who talked about homeschooling. And my dad just heard it on the radio one day. And my dad just thought like, wow, that, that just sounds really compelling, actually, um, because, you know, he had grown up. He was public school his whole life. And actually, right. both of his parents, this is ironic because he's, he's the one who dropped out of high school when he was in 10th grade. But both of his parents were lifelong public school teachers. And so my dad wow. had you know, a deep appreciation. And he was a, had a great relationship with his parents. So it wasn't like he was this rebel or something like that at all. Um, and so he had a great relationship with his parents. Um, and and he, he told his parents, he said, hey, I, I heard about this homeschooling thing. And they actually embraced it. They said, that's a great idea. And that's kind of crazy, right? Because that's like almost 40 years ago. And uh, you think about today, right? And like, yeah. you think about like, oh, 40 years ago, that was the, the good old days or whatever. But already, <laughs> like my grandparents had seen the decline of morality in the, in the schools in America because mm. they had started teaching right after World War II. And wow. at that time, like you, they would literally have Bible class in public school. Uh, they would mm -hmm. teach from the Bible. They would recite the Lord's Prayer every morning right after the Pledge of Allegiance. They would teach Bible class in, in a public school, an American public school. And that was not yeah. unheard of. It's very normal. Yeah. Uh, but by the time that they had finished their teaching career, you know, drugs had mm -hmm. kind of come into the scene. The hippie movement had happened. So there's free love and all these things going on. And so they just thought, well, if someday if we ever have grandchildren, yeah, we think this homeschooling thing would be a great thing. So my grandparents were supportive. My dad wanted to do it. Uh, and so uh, eventually my siblings and I came along. And so they started homeschooling us. And the crazy thing, I only learned this maybe five years ago, because uh, today we know that there's statistical evidence that shows that homeschoolers actually on average test about 20 percentage points higher than their public school peers. But at the time, there was nothing, no data whatsoever. About <laughs> right. That. And so the common knowledge, the common thought was that homeschool kids were going to be stupid. And, and um, my dad actually believed, he had told me that. He said he actually kind of thought that his kids were going to be, you know, maybe a little bit slower than wow. everybody else going to public school. But he said it would be better for my children to be stupid and go to heaven than, than, mm. than to be smart and go to hell. Wow. wow. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. That's, that's, that's like, real. that's controversial today, but back then, that's explosive, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, that's, yeah. I mean, because I don't think that people even thought that that was the trade off. Yeah. Like, I, I don't even <laughs> think that people would have been aware that that would be what they would have, have to actually choose between, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and yeah. today, yeah. even though we have more evidence, right. I think we're so, in many instances, maybe kind of locked into tradition. So we don't see that there are, 
other options. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And I'm saying, I'm like, you know, again, my mom's from Thailand, right? So like, she's a, you know, no, no one in in our Thai family at all. No one homeschools. We're the only family in our entire extended Thai family that ever homeschooled at all, right? And that's, you know, uh, same thing. Like, I think a lot of Asian families. There, yeah, you know, this is a, a new concept for a lot of them because it's not traditional from the background of the countries that they came from. And then when they came to America, they were trying to, you know, it, it, you know, it, what do you call it, you know, embrace American culture and society and not try to look like a sore thumb. And so they're just trying to just meld in with everybody else. But yeah, mm-hmm. not realizing like actually, you know, that's a, actually can be detrimental actually because. You know, some of the things that we offer now in public schools are horrible, terrible things now going on with sex education. And now there's yeah. the redefinition of uh, gender, yeah. or identity, uh, all kinds of crazy things that are happening now. So, yeah. 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 Well, you know, that's, that's one of the things, you know, we talk about education. Man, the, the big thing that we want to do is disciple our children. Yeah. You know, yeah. and yes, we, yeah. we want them to be smart. We want them to do, you know, well. But man, I think our emphasis and focus and the reason why we really saw the great opportunity to homeschool was for discipleship uh, reasons. You know, but one thing also, uh, you know, growing up, I, I thought that we all had to go to college. Right. Mm. I thought that I was told that this is the way yeah. out. You know, this yeah. is the way that you're supposed to go. Um, what's your thought on on college? And uh, do you believe that, that all children should go to college or how, how do you gauge is it automatic? Yeah. How do you gauge that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's really nuanced, actually. Um, and I'll, I'll phrase this in two things. One, I don't think everyone has to go to college. Um, and then secondly, if you do go to college, I don't think you have to do it the normal way that everyone else does it as well. So there's a, there's actually three choices that you can make here. One, you can choose not to go to college at all. Two, mm-hmm. you can choose to go to college and do it a traditional way. Or three, you can choose to go to college or get a college degree. I should say it like that. You can choose to get a college degree, but you can get it in a different manner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. that's what I did. Okay. Um, so I think that's really kind of the, the three choices out there. And I, I do believe that as faithful Christians, I think we can make any of those three choices and God can be honored in that. But I don't think we should make choices just, oh, just kind of blindly following yeah. whatever all my friends are doing. I think right. actually the Lord would be dishonored that. Um, and so I think God would rather us walk with wisdom, just like in, in the Proverbs, it talks about walking in wisdom and walk with our eyes wide open uh, mm-hmm. as we make choices. And that's probably why we're having this conversation tonight, yeah. just trying to help others that are listening learn about these ideas. So yeah. for the kids who are on the live and the parents as well, when, when they just heard you say, you know, maybe, maybe you don't go to college. How do you know, like, as you pray and as you sense the Lord's leading, how do you make that decision in both spiritual and practical ways to know what you should do? Oh, that's such a deep question, guys. And I, <laughs> I can't fully answer this in the time that we have. And I, I'm not an expert in this, but there was a great book actually that I read when I was 18 years old. I just graduated from from homeschooling and I was trying to make that decision. Do I go to a regular college? Do I skip college? Do I uh, get to do something different on an alternative path? And I was just so confused because it seemed like all of my friends, they knew what they were going to do. In fact, before the end of the year, all of my friends that I had been like in the same homeschool circles with all of them that were 18, they were all gone. Every Mm -hmm. single last one left the city of Austin, except for one. And he was going to University of Texas. But everybody else left, and I was the only kid left behind. And they mm. all seemed to have like a plan. Like they seemed to know what they were going to do. They would say, they would say the phrase, God told me to XYZ, or the Lord showed me to do XYZ. Well, mm. here I am. <laughs> I, I didn't wake up in the middle of the night with God whispering into my ear. I didn't hear an audible voice. I didn't like just have this aha moment. Yeah. I wasn't really sure. And I was a little bit concerned, actually, because all my other friends seemed to know what was going on. And eventually I shared this with some friends of mine. I shared with them. I said, maybe I'm going to die early. Oh, maybe no. Like, really? Literally, I, maybe I'm going to die young because maybe that's why God hasn't told me. Maybe I'm just going to die right here. Wow. And, of course, my friends were like, they were, like, really concerned at first. And, like, you know, like, are you suicidal? No, no, I'm not suicidal. Like, I, I'm actually really happy with life. I'm just, I don't have a clear answer. And so, you know, it was a very confusing time trying to d- discern the will of God. And around this time in life, I read a book called Just Do Something by Kevin DeYoung. Um, great book. I wish I had a copy. I don't have a copy with me right here. It's probably in the other half of the house. Um, it's a short little book, 100 pages. And it's about how do you d- 
discern the will of God. Like we use this phrase, will of God. How do you discern that? Especially as a young person, but as an old person, like how do you discern the will of God? And um, there's all these nuances to it. But really, I think what it really boils down to is, again, in the book of Proverbs, it wouldn't talk so much about wisdom and why it's so important to look for and seek wisdom unless we were expected to make choices yeah. with wisdom. Yeah. And sometimes God is very explicit. He will explicitly say in the Bible, thou shalt not do X, Y, and Z, right? right and then right. there's also principles that can be derived from those things as well. And so we should definitely regard that if the Bible is explicitly says, do not do X, Y, do not do it. And if you can derive a principle, which is pretty obvious, you should did not do that either. And that it's wise to seek counsel from other people and other friends, especially those that have gone before you and that you respect and that they love the Lord as well. It's, it's wise to discern that. Mm. But after all those all, those three little question marks right there, if, if you know the Bible is not explicitly against something, mm -hmm. if you know the Bible doesn't have like some type of teaching that you can sort of derive from that to get something. Mm -hmm. And if your counselors and mentors don't say like, oh, don't do you know, X, Y, Z. Well, then if there's multiple choices still in front of you that, you know, have passed all those litmus tests, then it's OK to choose something that you want to do. That's totally mm -hmm. fine. And mm -hmm. pray and ask that God would open doors and close doors. It's OK to walk through. You don't need to live in fear or terror that you're making the wrong decision because god still works with you know regular people like us and he will you know shape and mold situations to work out i think amen no i i really appreciate that because i i think what we often overlook is that even when we think that we have gotten a sense of what god wants us to do sometimes we think that that makes us perfect right that we're going to mm -hmm. execute that perfectly but i think really what we have is a dependence on the mercy of god to lead us and guide us whether we hear or have a strong sense or we feel like, well, I'm kind of bent in this way. I like doing this. I want to explore this. And then we go and do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So let's let's talk about this then, because the second option was you go to college the traditional way. Yeah. What, describe that today. Like, what does okay. that look like now? Yeah. So I can only share that from the context of my personal experiences and friends that I've had and family members I've had. Right. So everyone's going to have a slightly different experience. So here's what I know. Going to a traditional college today. Uh, there is a lot of debt that's sometimes involved. If, you're, if your family has the financial means to pay your way through school or you as a kid have somehow like saved up money over the great, awesome, that's wonderful. Yeah. But if you're about to take on a student loan in order to go to school, I'd, I'd really you know, hesitate on that. In fact, back in 2018, there was a study that found out that the average college student graduating from college with debt, their debt load was around $38,000. Now, that's a decent amount of money, right? $38,000. And that's just the average, right? Unfortunately, I've got a friend of mine. I, I just talked to him. He told me the story. It was a really sad story. I've got a friend of mine. He went to film school. And mm -hmm. to go to film school, he took on a hundred grand in student Man. loans. Man. That's, a, that's a lot of money. That's a yes. lot of money. In fact, at the time <laughs> he was telling me the story, it was because he and his wife and their, I think their four children were in the process of moving back into his parents' home. That's wow. embarrassing, right? That's wow. really embarrassing, right? But it's because he had accumulated a hundred grand in student loans. So that was a very poor financial decision on his part. I'm, yeah, I'm just being super honest. And he, he, he was the first to admit that also. Like that was a terrible financial decision, right? Um, okay, so let yeah. me let me ask this question. And I mean this totally respectfully. And and I, I want to get, um, get some wisdom from you on this. Okay, so film school, $100,000 film school. So, and, and just be 100%, what comes to my mind is, okay, so, you know, you would think that if you're going to go into the medical field, you would think that if you're maybe going to go into the study of the practice of law, um, you, you could imagine that that and above, you know, you, you might put a price tag on that. Do I, do I not understand something about film school <laughs> that it, that that would be the price to, I just <laughs> do you know what I mean like am I am I missing something that um maybe there's a technical aspect of it that I don't no. understand I don't yeah. that just seems exorbitant to me it, I I know I know so and I think he would say he would have agreed with the same thing as well now he is a talented filmmaker but I actually think he would say that he learned all of his filmmaking skills on set actually it wasn't yes. really film school it was later on when he was actually practicing the art of film that's mm. and he's a he's a very good filmmaker now I just don't think he learned those skills in college so that brings me to another question then, and I'm glad you said that, because what about, and, and why don't we think more about this in the body of Christ, what about apprenticeships? Like, mm, what about yeah. who have giftings or they have talents, 
And we could pair them up with people who are also gifted in that yeah. area. Do you save in that way as well? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that'd be great. Hey, I mean, maybe there's someone listening right now and they want to help create audio drama. Hey, have them contact me. I can use their <laughs> skills right yeah. now. I've got stuff they could do and I'll pay them nothing. Right. But I'll get them. Life skills <laughs> and experiences, you know? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just being super honest guys. Right. And that way that's a no risk, a no risk chance for me to get some help from somebody. I'm not risking it uh, because they're brand new and they're not going to bring, you know, many skills to the table, but that's also a no risk opportunity for a young 18, 19 year old kid to learn a trade or learn a craft and maybe just spend, you know, a couple, three, four, five months working on something. And then they could find like, actually this wasn't for me. Well, that's mm. totally fine. At least you didn't spend 20 grand doing that. Awesome. Mm. You know, wow. wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I think we, we waste a lot of time and money, you know, uh, we, we could, you know, with, with college. So, cause a lot of times it just seems to me now, you know, we can just talk about this, that uh, a, a lot of going to college is just because that's what we're supposed to do, you know, and then you get there and you graduate and it's kind of like, you don't even use what you mm. <laughs> went there for, you know, yeah. you end up working in a field that uh, is totally not what you went to school for. And, and then you learn on the job and things like that. And you're like, man, what did I do all, all that education for all the college, sure. you know? Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I really, I'm a believer in trade and the apprenticeship and seeing what our children are bent towards and saying, how can I nurture that? How can I uh, set something up around that to help them to grow in that? And put, because there may be a career in that thing, you know, and I think we have to think outside of the box like that and not just be, you know, molded by what, what we know, have normally seen in, in our culture. What are your thoughts on that, Paul? Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. I think, especially this idea, like, you know, sometimes um, there's this, even this concept, actually, of degree inflation. Uh, maybe you guys have heard that term before. Uh, so, okay. you know, monetary inflation is when basically um, mm. money, more money is being put into the system than anyone knows yeah. what to do. Yeah. So everyone's yeah. spending right. more money, everyone's making more money, but then the prices of things start going up because everyone's That's buying right. everything. And so, and so before you'd realize it, you were getting a hundred dollars, but now your hundred dollars is only worth like 50 bucks, you know, like, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and so that's why, you know, the price of stuff goes up and so it's inflation, yeah. but degree inflation. So way long ago, back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, when our mm -hmm. parents may have been growing up, or maybe when we were growing up, I should say, mm -hmm. and our parents were going through college at that time, the default was that everyone was going to get a high school diploma, mm -hmm. but to really stand out in the workforce, you needed to go get a bachelor's degree. And so yeah. it was this kind of assumed thing, like, hey, if you've got a bachelor degree, you're going to be more desirable to hire than someone with just mm -hmm. a regular college diploma. And so pretty soon, everyone started getting a college degree, and you know, for for admirable intentions, right? All of us got college degrees. You guys got college degrees. I got college degree, mm -hmm. right? We all got college degrees. But now there's this phenomenon that everyone's getting a college degree. To, so to actually stand out, right? You have to get a master's degree, yeah. right? And or and it, 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 it Google it. It's called um, it's called degree inflation. It's a real thing. Uh -huh. And so having the the buying, the earning power of a bachelor's degree is no longer as powerful as it used to be 30, 40 years ago. But the master's mm -hmm. degree, now that's become kind of the, the new, you know, so it's this mm -hmm. weird inflation thing going on. Um, yeah. So let's talk about your third option. So you, okay. you yeah. can hack the college system, right? You can, yeah. you can make your way through and not go into debt in the way sure. that we have traditionally thought about doing it. Sure. And I think this is the option that you went with, is it not? It is, it is. So I can talk as long or as little as you want me to talk about this. Um, but so what I did is I essentially, I realized, okay, I, I'm gonna get a college degree. I'm gonna get the degree because my dad wants me to get the degree. And he convinced me at the time, he's like, you know, Paul, you never know, da, 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 maybe it would be helpful. Yeah. But yeah. I was of the opinion, well, I'm not just gonna like sit around and get this degree. I'm gonna go work and get a real job and while I'm working, making real money, paying my own way and living life, I will also earn the degree on the side as well. Mm. And so that's why it took me a long time to do that. Uh, but here are some of the hacks that I did. One is that while I was still in high school, so I was you know, 11th grade, 12th grade, I found out that my local community college would let me attend their school and earn college credits that I could count as dual credit, you know, dual credit classes for my homeschooling but also actual college credits get to be eventually transferred. And the price was dirt cheap. I think I paid $40 <laughs> per class. 
uh, mm-hmm. which is just like nothing. That's nothing, yeah. guys. Right. Yeah. So literally, by the time I finished, uh, by the time I finished um, my high school career, right, uh, graduated from homeschooling, mm-hmm. uh, I had my first year of college was totally done. Uh, I had wow. 32 credits, and it literally cost me, I think, $320 <laughs> plus books total. My entire wow. first year of college only cost me three hundred dollars plus books. <laughs> that's amazing. That's ama- yeah, that's, that's yeah, amazing. That's amazing. Guys. That's amazing. Yeah. That's super amazing. Uh, and so you sound, and also, you sound like a used car salesman. That's right. Paul, you're that's like right. that's amazing. And if that you let me now, we're gonna throw in headlights. That's right. <laughs> and so then from there, then I also then felt like that a lot of the other you know classes that I needed to take. Okay, well now I can start taking from community colleges, from real colleges. You know. But it's going to start costing some real money now, right? Instead of being 40 bucks a class, it's going to be like 600 bucks a class. And, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, you're doing the math on that. And then I found out about CLEP testing and Dante's testing. So these are tests that have been created to abate, essentially let you study on your own. And then you sit down for this massive pass fail test. Normally it's multiple choice. And it is worth actual college credits. It's called CLEP testing, C L E P. Um, and so I started just taking a lot of CLEP tests. So I clept out of, I, I took a CLEP test for all my American literature stuff that, you know, normally you would have had to sit in a classroom and be bored to death or be, you know, reading these terrible books or what, whatever, right? I could just cram for the test probably in about a week. And then I could go and take the test. Uh, and so what I did in about a week was what would have taken someone an entire semester to do. And they would have spent several hundred dollars doing it. I did it and it cost me about $80 for the test. Wow. Um, and so I clipped out of a lot of, uh, so I took tests to get out of a lot of things. Yeah. Um, and then at the very end, there's a handful of schools around the nation. And these are, these are reputable state institutions. Uh, the school that I chose was Thomas and Thomas Edison state university in New Jersey. And okay. they're a state college in New Jersey. It's a university, a state university. Uh, and I transferred all of my credits from all the tests that I took and from my community college days and just a whole assortment of work. I gathered all my credits and I transferred it all into Thomas Edison. And then I took one class with them because they still wanted me to take one class. So I did. I took one class with them online. Uh, and then I graduated with, with my entire degree. Um, and I later did the math. I sat down and figured out like all the cost of all the tests that I took, the you know classes that I took that were online, um, the community college, the books. I counted up the cost of all the books. Uh, and at the end of the day, when you took all the expenses and everything, I got a scholarship for a thousand dollars also somewhere in there. Um, <laughs> my whole, my whole, my entire, um, college education cost me about $9,000. Wow. The, the whole thing, everything, the whole all. thing, the whole thing, wow. everything from beginning to end, $9,000. Wow. And, wow. uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, Man. and so I have a degree from a, from a state, from a state college in New Jersey. Um, and <laughs> so what's, what's been your journey as far as your career goes, as you look back on all of that and even being among your peers and saying, well, I don't know what I feel called to. I don't, yeah, I don't have that call. Yeah. Talk about the journey of your career and what it seems that the Lord has designed you to do ultimately. Yes. That's a great question too. So the whole time that I was earning my degree, I was working a full-time job. So for a while mm-hmm. I was working for, actually, I, I, I did a whole range of things actually. So for a while I was a fire extinguisher technician and I would travel okay. to gas stations and Hobby Lobbies and any store that has any place that has a fire extinguisher in Texas, I would go there and I would change out their fire extinguishers or re- replenish them. Uh, okay. And so I was okay. did that for a long time. And then I was a computer programmer for a while, building websites for authors and business owners. Um, okay. And then I ended up as a lobbyist for the Texas Homeschool Coalition. And I know you're asking yourself, like, how are these things connected? And <laughs> they're not. They're, they're not connected. None of these things make sense. But that's what I So I was a lobbyist for the Texas Homeschool Coalition after being a fire extinguisher technician and a web programmer. I know it's, it's weird. And then after being a, a lobbyist, uh, then I did a brief stint doing some filmmaking, actually, uh, made some commercials. Um, and then I became a political consultant and did that for many years. And then I was a business consultant and did that for a short time. Uh, And then, and now I'm a podcaster. And I know you're- Yeah. All that had to do with communication. You you had to communicate a lot. And you know, my degree was not in communications. My degree was in in business administration. And what's Uh wild is my degree, right? That I earned, right? I spent the $10,000 getting that degree. I I do not believe I've actually used any of this, anything that I learned from 
my you know college time. I don't think I've used any yeah. of those things actually for my, my <laughs> career actually. And I'm yeah. glad then I'm so glad then that I did not spend a hundred grand or right. four years of my life getting that degree. Instead, I was actually living real life and dabbling in and experimenting and realizing and understanding what did I like, what did I not like, and finding out where my skill sets lie. Wow. Wow, man, that's amazing. That it's amazing to see all the different things that you were able to do. But you know, the way there's no wasted time with with God if we're following his will, you know, and it's great that you didn't have to waste time. Like you said, you, you got your d- degree, but you didn't have to go the traditional route that most people go. But at the same time, you know, the, the experience and having different work environments and 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 having to keep a schedule and doing all that stuff, I'm I'm sure it has helped even with what you're oh, doing God. today. Absolutely. So. You hit the nail on the head, actually, because all of those things, doing mm. real life for real bosses for real money that yeah. you could actually get fired from, yeah. that <laughs> that was actually the most educational thing that ever happened to me. So you told yeah. me like, working in the workforce is the number one thing that will prepare you for the workforce. Okay, awesome. so let me back up here, because when we talk about college and as parents think about where their kids will go, like say they feel like the Lord has called them to go to the university um, or maybe to go to a smaller school or something like that, um, there is a concern about retaining their faith. You know, mm, we don't yeah, want our yeah. kids to go away and turn away, right? right, yeah, so, right yeah. so what encouragement do you have? Like, how do we begin um, even to think about our kids going away and being fortified enough to be able to stand once they're gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's a really deep question there, Austin. And that could be a whole conversation on its own. And I'll <laughs> yeah. be the first to say, I'm not an expert in this, right? I'm only 33. Uh, I only have my experiences of me kind of like, you know, doing my college sure. experience, my wife doing yeah. but I don't have children of my own that I sent to college, right? My kids are still young, right? So my, mm-hmm. my perspective is going to be a little warped and distorted, but hopefully helpful still. <laughs> um, so, so two things I'll shift on that. One, we can, we can never do anything that will guarantee that our children do not step away from the faith. We mm-hmm. cannot do that, right? And we right, would be right. lying to ourselves to claim that we can, right? Now, obviously, we should walk with wisdom and we should try and pray. We should pray yeah. for that, but we yeah. can never guarantee. In fact, I think about God the Father, right? God the Father is the perfect Father, and His mm-hmm. first, you know, the Son of Man, right? Adam, the son, right? Adam. <laughs> And Eve, yeah. they're in the perfect environment with a perfectly loving father, and they still disobey and digress, mm, right? Transfer, yeah. Right. That's super true, uh, because that's what happened, right? And we're all, you know. But right. um, with that said, um, I think also as we think about like, okay, sending our children, we don't want to do that with just like a blind eye, like, oh, okay, mm-hmm. I helped school them; uh, they're good enough, you know. They're they're just gonna stick with their guns and stick with their. I, I would never make that assumption, right? So probably couple things that I'd offer, you know, if your kids go off to another school and there's, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, right? If they go to school someplace else, I would just stay in, in close communication with them and just, you know, be mm-hmm. their friend, be their counselor. You are you're no longer like the one controlling their life once they're out of your home, but you, yeah. hopefully you've developed a relationship with them that now you're their friend and they're, they're your yeah. account. You're their counselor, their trusted counselor. Um, so that's probably one thing I would think about. Another thing I would also think about is also, Deeply consider, like, if you're sending your kid to a secular school or a Christian school, be careful about that term Christian school. Um, Mm. Unfortunately, you know, as a podcaster, right, I will get pitches from different universities and schools because they will ask me to rep them to our podcast audience. Uh, And unfortunately, I have some friends of mine who recently went, uh, and they're also podcasters, they recently went to a Christian school that had approached me and had approached them about being, you know, advertising for both of them. And uh, they went to this Christian school and the mother mm-hmm. had a great, exp- a relatively good experience there. Uh, mm-hmm. But her daughter also went to this Christian school to just kind of check it out because she was a prospective student. I think she was 17 at the time. And yeah. she had like a night and day different experience. Basically, she was taken on this different track for the students and it was completely different. Mm-hmm. There was no mention of Christ. Even though it was a Christian school, there was no mention of Christ. Instead, this Christian school, this Christian school went out of its way to showcase to the students, the prospective students, about their gender inclusivity spaces, uh, and their LGBTQ friendly areas. And it was wow. it was just like shocking because like what the mother was being fed by the admissions counselor was totally, totally not what the student was being fed. And guess what? Wow. Who's actually going to go to the school in? It's That's right. 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 That's right. right. Again, when you say something that Christians do not your guard down right 
Do you never right. assume, never assume that, oh, you just, they're okay because they're a Christian. That's not true at all. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, I, and no, I, no. no, go ahead, Paul. Go ahead. Finish your thought. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. No, I just wanted to acknowledge Meg's comment here. Meg says that homeschooling isn't a magic bullet. And she's right. absolutely right. Like what we know when we look at the data, please excuse my voice, is that um, that we have students, we have kids, um, whether they're traditionally schooled or homeschooled, walking away from the faith. Mm -hmm. And what we found in the body of Christ is that we've got a discipleship issue. We've got an issue where kids are not being discipled. But it doesn't help when you have someone working against even your mediocre discipleship efforts. And so oh, what we're trying to true. say is don't work against yourself in your attempts to do that. But I think Meg is absolutely right. So one of the things that I wanted to focus on and, and thinking about as we are preparing and would send our kids to college, if that's the way that they are bent, mm -hmm. if that's what the Lord is calling them to, that we not only disciple them at home, right, but that we teach them to discern once they leave the home. Sure. Yeah, I think it's yeah. so important. And especially to the point that you just made, you've got a kid who's walking on to a Christian college. It's got the name mm -hmm. Christian college. Right. And so there might be some expectations that come along with that. Well, one of the ways that we shore up our kids is that we teach them to, to discover or to uncover the subtleties in deception, right? Like that you might have somebody who says, well, my faith allows me to do this, mm. right? So, so how do our kids know that there is just the faith? Yeah. That there is just one faith that you don't have sort of like your version of the faith where you get to do this and you get to do that. And I think that's a huge part of discipleship. That's a huge part of making sure that our kids understand what some of the lies are that that are out in the culture. I mean, would you agree with that, Paul? I, I would agree with that also. Yeah, certainly. And I think there's probably some schools and institutions that are probably even more helpful to send our children to. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I hope at, at no point in this conversation am I trying to dismiss the validity of going to a traditional brick and mortar school. Um, sure. I think that, you know, like if, for instance, like, Hey, if I'm going to have open heart surgery, I would sure hope that my surgeon didn't just go to school online and learn how to do surgery online and has never worked <laughs> on a physical body before. Right? right? Like, no, right. no, no. I want someone who went for many years and has worked on real people's bodies. That's who I want to do. Yes. My open heart surgery, right? <laughs> Same thing with that. I'm going to get on an airplane and we're going to fly through the sky. Yeah. I'd like to have someone who has a great deal amount of schooling and understanding and they know how to build airplanes. That'd be really So you don't want, you don't want clip classes for surgery. I, I don't want clip <laughs> testing for surgery because some things are just not made for that. Guys. Um, you know, uh, so, so I, yeah. And I think there's certain things in our lives, like, you know, certain, you know, uh, industries that you might pursue that it's just going to take longer to prepare for this. Like, again, like medicine, um, engineering, those things are going to take longer. These are the types of things that you shouldn't necessarily learn on the learn. I mean, yes, you'll learn some things in the field, but there's a lot to learn in the classroom too, before you ever get into the field in the first place. Um, yeah. so yeah, I hope, I hope nothing I said was like, you know, making that feel like, oh, I'm making a bad decision by choosing a, a traditional brick and mortar school. No, no I, don't I don't think, think so. so. I, don't I don't think so at all. And and I think that people like we all, and this is a part of the fun of this live, right? That we all come and we all have our convictions. And right. so a lot of sure. times we filter what we're hearing through those convictions and through those presuppositions. And, and that's totally fine. We love it. We love, this is a wild audience, Good. right? Um, okay. I'm going to put you on the spot here though, Paul, and I'll give okay. a disclaimer on your behalf because of the question I'm about to ask you. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask you for a short list here, okay, of colleges and universities that come to your mind oh, that yeah, you think yeah. would be <laughs> among the trusted ones that you would recommend. I, I'm okay? happy to give you a short list. So this is just what comes to my mind right away. And I'm sure if like, oh, I sat down for like 10 minutes, I could think of a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. But off the top of my head, if I was going to send my kid to a brick and mortar school, uh, one that comes to my mind is Masters University out in Southern California. It's John mm. MacArthur's church. Uh, I know that everyone's like super, uh, you know, it's up to you guys to kind of figure out the theology <laughs> where you're where with that John MacArthur when it comes to cessationism. I'll leave that up to y'all. Paul, <laughs> why are you being messy on this that live? Can. That's <laughs> right, guys. That's right. Paul, you've been right trolling us on Facebook. <laughs> but, but I will say that the school itself, I was a big fan of what they're doing. Um, sure. And the way that they approach Christian worldview, they make all their professors sign a statement of faith. Oh, yeah, I should also mention that other... Christian school, which they actually advertise quite heavily on a lot of podcasts, actually. It's really sad. Um, they, none of their professors sign a statement of faith, except for the ones mm. in their theology department. But oh, everyone, wow. that's teaching, wow. everyone that's teaching biology, uh, you know, <laughs> anything else, arts, blah, blah, blah. They don't even have, they don't sign a statement of faith at all, wow. right? And I guess they, so they, don't, to be they don't believe in worldview then. 
they don't believe uh, in the power of worldview. Yeah, apparently not. Apparently not. It's really, it's really okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. But at Masters University, though, all the all the all the um, all the professors sign the same statement of faith. It's actually pretty rigid, and actually, students to apply to the school must bring a pastor's written note of like an endorsement. Uh, so they're actually highly selective about the students that they're bringing in. So like some schools might say like, Hey, you know, we have this sort of like philosophy of like, we're trying to, um, be like an evangelistic school toward our student body. But Mm -hmm. for master's university, their approach is like, no, no, we are a discipleship school for our student body. We are already assuming that everyone that's here is a strong believer already. And we're trying to up them in in their, their walk in the Lord. Um, So so that's one, one, that's one traditional school there. Another one is Union University. I think they're out in uh, uh, Tennessee, I think. U- Union, Union University. University. Um, okay. So that's the second one right there. I will also offer two secular options also. These are not traditional Ooh. schools. These are non-traditional education alternatives. And they're okay. secular. But okay. I think they are very effective in what they do. And you should just take it with a grain of salt. And it was kind of the thing that I did uh, to like get my degree as fast as I could even though it's really slow, but as cheap as I could, right? While living life. <laughs> so the first one is called Peloton U. Peloton U. I think their their uh, <laughs> website is PelotonU.org. And okay. they like, essentially- Like the bike company? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Peloton, but then the letter U, like university. Okay, yeah. PelotonU.org. They're not associated with bike company. I'm not, okay, I'm just asking. It's not like I'm not opposed to it, Paul. Like I'm no, not saying no. no to Peloton. I'm just asking, like, is that no. the one I'm saying? Okay. Yep, yep. And so what they do is they uh, they take people that are working full-time jobs and they coach them through college, essentially. It's a pretty affordable. They help you find other schools like the one that I went to, Thomas Edison State University. They help you get connected with other schools that will let you transfer in credits, large amounts mm. of credits from other, you know, degree programs. Um, so that way you can, uh, uh, you know, find the right degree program that works for you. And they'll kind of work with you through the process. A lot of the education is done online and then you transfer all your credits in. So that's Peloton U. And then Peloton the last U. one, yeah, you know, Peloton U. And then the okay. last one is the college alternative. Um, so instead of going to college, it is about placing you with an apprenticeship. Um, they have a okay. whole host of uh, a whole suite of companies they work with. Um, and I, uh, what was there? Uh, oh, Praxis. That's what they're called. Praxis. Hmm. Dis- Praxis. Discoverpraxis.com. Discoverpraxis.com. And they will essentially, uh, they've got a whole suite of like 20, 30 different companies all across America that have these internship programs that they've already worked with these companies. They will then take your student. Uh, or a young adult. And I think for the first like 12 weeks, Praxis will work with you on building job ready skills. So mm-hmm. they're just learning about workplace communication, how to use software, how to make stuff happen and be a, an effective member of the workforce. Then you will get placed at the company and you'll do like a nine month apprenticeship with them. And okay. at the end of the apprenticeship, I think most of the time you're normally offered a job with that company, actually, because they, you know, it, now if you've done a terrible job, there's no guarantee of it. <laughs> All right. There. Right. Um, but that's what they're called. And so they're secular. So Peloton, you is secular discover mm-hmm. praxis is secular, but I happen to know that many of the employees of both of these companies are believers also. So it's not like you're walking into a hostile environment, but it's neither is it a Christian environment either. It's just, uh, you know, eyes wide open yeah. in there. Yeah. 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 I, and I know it's a uh, concern over a lot of parents. They're trying to figure out, even, especially with the, you know, what's going on in culture, you know, the wokeness and things like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Man, on the, on the university level, it's, it's re- really out of control, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so as a Christian, you know, it, it looking at different colleges and like, man, where can I send my child to, to mm-hmm. make sure yeah. that, you know, some of these things are not being uh, like my discipleship is not being undermined. You know, yeah. Um, and yeah. I know that's like you said, there's no surefire way to to protect every aspect of things. But man, you don't want to send your child to a place where it's going to be totally against yeah. what you you know what you've taught. So it's it yeah. it has to be more difficult now than ever. I would think. You know. Yeah. So Paul, yeah. I'm wondering this if you can kind of talk us through, and and I know we're coming to the end of this live here, but to kind of talk us through ultimately how you became the host of the compelled podcast right so so we've just heard about all of your incredible jobs right <laughs> like we've heard about all of your incredible talents somebody said you're like the sure. man from catch me if you can so like all of these <laughs> different things that you're able to do um but now you've kind of settled here and you're hosting compelled 
And I mean, it's just incredible what the Lord is doing. And and I mean that not as like a nice Christian nicety, but truly the Lord is doing incredible ministry Mm -hmm. through this podcast. I mean, people are coming to faith in the Lord. Mm -hmm. They're being encouraged Mm -hmm. where maybe there was like a dry season in their life, but they are reminded that the Lord is real and that he's active in the life of his people. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord is using compelled. How did this even come about? Sure. That's a great question. And I could only say like, hey, it's it's God who brought this about. So I'm going to tell mm-hmm. the story. This is how God did it, right? And it, it, it all its yeah. messiness. So uh, I already told you that strange events where I was the fire extinguisher technician, a web programmer, <laughs> a lobbyist, yeah. a political consultant, a business consultant, a bunch of random things that happened. And so um, uh, in 2018, I had been I had been a political consultant for about uh, almost 10 years at that point. And I've been doing Texas politics since I've been, you know, uh, for, for a long time, really. And um, I was really burned out. Um, I'd reached the stage where uh, I, I was now married. We had a one-year-old daughter and I was spending no time with my wife or my baby daughter because I was mm-hmm. just constantly working. Uh, the Texas political cycle stops for nobody. It does not rest mm-hmm. uh, on weekends or at nighttime. Everything's happening. Right. Uh, and not only that, but also I, I was like experiencing, uh, you know, basically like, um, I could not experience peace, right? Because my candidates, if they were doing well, I was happy. But if they were doing poorly, then I was upset. If a hit piece came out in the mail that said lies about the candidate, then I took that very personally. And it was just getting in this weird uh, conundrum. Uh, and unfortunately, I also realized, like, not only was it affecting my attitude, but I also realized that, like, you know, at no point did I ever stop and pray mm. for my political opponents. I mm. only sought their destruction and demise at the ballot box. That's all I ever sought, right? And so I never yeah. cared. Like, and it was just like this really weird thing. And so 2018, my wife looks at me and she said, Paul, we have to stop. We can't keep doing this. This is really unhealthy for our family dynamic. Uh, mm. And it was. It really was. And so uh, we took a little family vacation, first vacation that we'd ever taken as a family. Um, and on that trip, we went to the Ark Encounter. Uh, you know, there with Ken Ham and the Creation Museum, yeah. mm. and then we went to the Indianapolis Children's Museum, and we went to the the Christian Worldview Film Festival. Just did a whole little tour of uh, Middle America there, and uh, on that trip, um, we began praying, asking God, like, what are there other things that we could do besides politics? And um, and instead of just trying to destroy people's lives with the stupid stuff that they've done and publicize that, is there something mm. else that we could do? And uh, perhaps on this trip, I, I don't know exactly what it was, but so it was on this trip, though, that we just began to kind of get the sense like, hey, uh, we know a lot of people have done stupid stuff in their lives earlier, but then they became Christians and God really redeemed that story. Or maybe they already were Christian. They did stupid stuff and then they came to repent and God redeemed that story. And so that's how we ended up starting Compelled um, was just wanting to share stories of what God is doing. And these are great stories of how God redeemed really messy, terrible, horrible situations. Um, and so, yeah, so we started doing that and while we were doing that, you know, it wasn't full time or anything. I was still doing that, you know, part time. And so I was doing business consulting at that point, took all my political clients and did all the political projects, just did business consulting for the next four years, uh, while we also podcasted at the same time. And then about a year ago, I went full time on the podcast. Wow. That's awesome. And so, you know, you said that it was a much needed change uh, it, it, that your wife was like, hey, we need to do something different. Uh, uh, as you look back at it now, you feel like, man, that was exactly the right thing to do. And you oh, yeah. seem like major differences in, yeah. uh, you know, in your family life, you know, yeah. because yeah. of the being, you know, being sensitive to that. Really? Oh, yes. Yes. We really have. In fact, yeah. um, I'll go so far as to say this. I think you know, the same way that God has used the podcast to bless other people. And we, mm. we receive feedback all the time from people that have really been blessed by these stories of what God is already doing. And we're just yeah. unearthing these stories. But God yeah. has also used the podcast to bless us. We wow. were um, we had just started the podcast. Literally, we had just started the podcast. We were recording interviews. We hadn't even released one yet. And uh, my wife and I, we were 16 weeks pregnant with our second child. And mm. uh, we miscarried. And mm-hmm. it was just horrific. Like we were just completely shocked. No one in our extended wow. families had ever had a miscarriage. We were 16 weeks, you know, way beyond the, you know, the scary period of 12 weeks. And so we, you know, we were, you know, decently along. We were going to go find the baby's gender and stuff, you know, wow. so just devastating. And I kid you not, within, I think, four days later, we already had this interview that was already pre-scheduled. We pre-scheduled this thing like hmm. weeks and months ahead of time. Um, and so even though we miscarried, we still went and did the interview about five days later. And so like, you know, again, we're just kind of, uh, you know, there's a lot of trauma going on. So we, we showed up yeah. to this interview and it was with a lady named Carol Everett 
and she she tells her story in on her podcast but she tells her story to us we're just sitting there face to face with her and she was an abortion clinic owner she owned mm. it a clinic and she did about thirty thousand abortions and mm. she had wow. aborted her own baby and she had helped these thirty thousand other women abort their children as well and she profited wow. off of that and that was her lifestyle and it, just a lot of things how god ended up working in her heart and and she, carol is sharing all these things with us and i don't know what it was man but it was something about how she shared, like, you know, the preciousness of life and how it shocked her. And it was exactly what we needed to hear at that very moment from this lady who had no idea that we had just miscarried like four days prior. Wow. Um, and yet God had like set that up. And we had that interview and we walked away. We were so deeply encouraged. And I know you're thinking, like, how could it a story wow. about an abortion? It's like, no, it really, really encouraged us because how God yeah. changed this lady's lifestyle. Um, wow. And that's what exactly what we needed to hear at that time also. Mm. Oh my goodness, Powerful. Paul. Okay. So, so we're all, I already feel like kind of in like ministry mode, right? So, so our <laughs> final question here on the culture proof podcast, we want to ask every guest um, to share with us what you are reading recently mm. or what you have read in scripture that has taught you, corrected you, reproved you or trained you in righteousness. Oh, wow. Great question. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I just came back from a conference in Indianapolis. It was the Gospel Coalition Conference, and okay. we'd never been there before. John Piper was one of the keynotes, and hmm. uh, uh, David Platt, and a bunch of other great, great uh, speakers. And uh, there was this guy from Africa, and his name was, I'm going to get the name wrong, but was, his name was Kenneth Mwegwa. Mbe Mbegwa. Uh, I can't even say it right now. <laughs> now this guy, he had this incredible, incredible Nigerian, or Kenyan, incredible Kenyan accent. Uh, it was so cool. He was reading from the Bible, and he was teaching from uh, Exodus chapter 14, which is the story of the Israelites. They fled into the wilderness away from the Egyptians, and they finally get to the Red Sea, and they turn around, and there is Pharaoh's army coming to destroy them. And what was crazy, I'd never really noticed this. At the very beginning of all the plagues, and this is what the pastor is pointing out. At the beginning of all the plagues, Moses had said, to Pharaoh, he said, you know, let my people go. Uh, mm -hmm. The Lord says, let my people go. Right. And Pharaoh says, who is the Lord? Mm. <laughs> That's what he says. And here's the crazy mm -hmm. thing. You know, in our Bibles, like it uses the word Lord, but sometimes if it's in all caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's actually, that's an, that, that is Yahweh is actually Yahweh. the term that's being used. It's different mm -hmm. than the other Hebrew words that were, I don't know why they say the Lord, you know. But so, so actually what Pharaoh said, if you look at the text, it actually says, who is Yahweh? That mm -hmm. is what Pharaoh had said. Mm -hmm. Well, now you fast forward to uh, chapter 14. Pharaoh has finally let the people of Israel go, but now he's coming back to slaughter them all, right? He's bringing his elite forces of Egypt, the, one of the greatest military mites of that time, right? Maybe the greatest military in the whole world at the time. And the Israelites, they're turning around and they're just a bunch of tourists with a bunch of extra baggage. That's all they are. They're not a military force. They have no weapons. They've never trained. They're not like, oh, two nations are going to. No, it's going to be a slaughter. That's what this is. And the people of Israel rush up to Moses saying, like, how could you dare bring us out here? You blah, blah, blah. You know, they're complaining and weeping. And, <laughs> and then Moses turns to God. It's like, well, what, what's going to happen? You know, like, right, why are you letting this right. happen to me? And God, and I'm paraphrasing, God essentially says, Moses, just calm down. Because I'm going to show my glory mm -hmm. so that the people of Israel may remember in the future who I am. Mm. And I'm going to show Pharaoh who I am. I'm going to and remember because Pharaoh had said back in chapter five, he said, who is Yahweh? Mm -hmm. And now Yahweh says, I'm going to show who Yahweh is. And he does. Mm. right? And he, and he destroys Pharaoh's army there in the end. And that wow. was all for the point of whenever we face terrible, horrible things in life that we cannot possibly understand or comprehend, or when we're fearful, when we're afraid that, man, my child is going to go to school, or, hey, my child is moving, they've rebelled, they're moving out of the house, and I'm fearful for them, and I'm so worried about what's going to happen in the future. Remember that the Lord is still Yahweh. He's mm. still the Lord, the mm. Yahweh, who could save the children of Israel from the, you know, the, the armies of Egypt, um, and he's still the, the Yahweh that he was then, that he is today um, and so i think a lot of personal encouragement from that guys Amen. exodus oh, chapter man. 14 so good Exodus that 15. is so good, awesome. man. Oh, but that's a great way for us to wrap up oh, this yeah, podcast. I definitely. mean, that is so encouraging that we can put our full faith in who Yahweh yes. is, that he yes. does not change. He is the immutable God. Mm, yeah. Amen. 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 
Amen. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, that's it. We're going to sign off. I was looking now. I want to make sure before I let you go yeah. here. Okay, Paul, I was looking to make sure that we didn't overlook any questions, but there were a lot of comments and I didn't see any questions. So if I overlooked anybody's question, you can pop it up here really quickly. Um, that pertains to this topic. Okay. That's right. That's right. We can stop for some time here, right? We can stop for some time here. Any questions that pertain to this topic, and then we'll make sure that we get that question answered, and uh, and then wrap up. But if there aren't any questions, then then we're going to wrap up this live. Paul, thank you so much for Man, joining we appreciate us. It. Thanks, guys. It's always a pleasure, y'all. This has awesome. been so much fun. All right, we'll do it again. Okay. All right. Sounds like a plan. All right, everybody. <laughs> have a good night. Until next time, Lord willing. God bless. <laughs>